Welcome everyone, my name is Kevin. I'm one of the pastors here at Crossroads and I just want to welcome you and I want to say that no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, we believe that you have a spot here at Crossroads. Whether you're just exploring who God is or you've been around for a while, uh, we want you to know that you're welcome here at Crossroads. And we also want you to know that we have prayed for you and we've prayed for this entire service from the very beginning to the very end. So I know that you're gonna meet God today. Grab a cup of coffee, get relaxed, and let's see what God's gonna do in our hearts and through this service this morning. My name is Evan. And my name is David. And I just wanted to welcome you to our service here at Crossroads. Um, if you're new here, we would love to get you connected with our community. So there's going to be a number on the screen and you can text here to that number um, so we can get you connected and involved in what we do here at Crossroads. Yeah. And this week is all about being wise. And that's something that a lot of us struggle with, um, that as we are following Jesus, we need to act like Jesus because that is the greatest way for us to be ambassadors for Christ, for us to actually help people see the light of Jesus is by us acting like Jesus and forgiving and being kind and compassionate even when kind and compassion is not the first reaction. And so being wise in how we act shows so much for who we are as Christians and it's a really important thing for us to do. And Speaking of actions, there's a couple actions coming up, like a couple yeah, of events. We yeah, we actually only have one. Um, mm -hmm. We have our Easter services posted on our website, so if you are interested in coming to one of our Easter services, mm -hmm. all the times are on our website, and you can check that out to see which one you want to come to. Oh, awesome. All right, let me go ahead, and as we just proceed into this service, let me go ahead and pray over it for us. Lord, thank you so much for this wonderful day, and thank you for the opportunity we get to just spend time with you and to learn and grow more closer to you, Lord. And I know that there can be so much chaos in the world and there can be so much going on and it can feel like there's just no other options but to react out of anger and react um, rashly. But I just pray that through this week you can have your hand over us and help us be wise and make those wise decisions so we can turn eyes towards you, Lord, and we can turn people to see your light. I love you so much and I am so thankful you're my father. Amen. give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only you give bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken Oh 
So as we get ready uh, to receive tithes and offerings, I just want to say first off, church, thank you for your faithfulness, for your generosity. God is working through your gifts and your generosity, and we are seeing lives changed um, each and every week. And I just want to say thank you. I, I love this passage. This is First Chronicles 29, 14 says this, but who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, God. And we have only given what comes from your hand. I love that reminder. Listen, everything that we have comes from God. Even every breath that we take comes from God. And so what we're giving right now is what God's already given to us. God is so good. And this is a chance for us to recognize and to give cheerfully back to him. Church, thanks again for your generosity. Let me pray for our tithes and offerings as we get ready to receive. And uh, as I do that, there's some ways to give on the screen right now. You can give online. You can give uh, via check on our website. However you give, we want to say thank you. Let me pray. Lord, um, here we are in this place. I'm grateful that you're working in our church, whether we're meeting uh, in person or online. You're here. You're working in our midst. Um, Lord, I'm grateful for the way uh, that every person um, that calls on your name, that you are faithful, that you are true, that you're full of grace. And Lord, I'm grateful that we're a church that's reaching people and it's possible because of the generosity of people, uh, even like the people right now that are, wor that are uh, worshiping and watching along with us. So Lord, um, I just pray you bless these tithes, these offerings for your purposes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's get ready, church. Well, today marks the end of a two-year journey. Maybe you are very familiar with it. Maybe you are uh, brand new to watching Crossroads. And so today is the end of our one journey. And uh, we started this journey two years ago in March of 2022. And it has been a, a discipleship process um, over the course of two years. And as we um, come to a, a close, come to a, a, a new chapter uh, that begins after today, we thought it'd be fun to look back 
and to remember uh, part of what made the journey so impactful in our lives. So um, take a look. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Let's keep the main thing as the main thing. One name, one life, one church, one way. Now this passage that we just read together, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5, is a prayer. It's a famous prayer. It's maybe the prayer that's been prayed more than any other prayer in the history of prayer. It's called the Shema in Hebrew. Jesus as he was growing up, would have prayed this prayer. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. All. All. So, when you see God as the one true God, the response is to offer him your one and only life. And the question is, how much of your one and only life? That would be all. (laughs) Yeah, I'm going to love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. And and I don't, look, I don't know where your um, love God meter is (laughs) these days, where your needle is. For most of us, it's not pegged on all. (laughs) It's somewhere in there. And so this is the question that I wanted to leave you with today. What would it look like to love God with all? I don't know what we have. We don't have much, but whatever we have is yours. It's all yours. Take our time, our talent, our treasures. And if you can do something with that God that glorifies you, I'm in. What would it look like if a couple thousand people did that? What could God do with our surrender um, to him? I was young. My mom Uh, had lost my brother and I because of her addictions and bad decisions to foster family. During that time, I got to meet a wonderful family in Papa Stan and Mama Trudy. They taught us how to sit at a dinner table with no TV in the room and (laughs) have conversation. And we had my favorite time of night, which was worship. And when we got to worship, we would shout and sing and dance and lift our hands. And it was an awesome time. I asked Mama Trudy, I said, Mama Trudy, how come we go to church? We don't do this. We don't sing, we don't dance, we don't give God everything we got. And she looked at me and she said, baby, I don't know. That's a good question. And I recall not too long after, we went to church on a Sunday and oh, that song came on. We were getting ready to get into that song and the spirit of the Lord. And I was doing everything that I could to contain myself, every bit of it. But my foot started to do this little happy feet thing. And Mama Trudy, she tapped me on the shoulder and said, baby, go ahead, go out there in the aisle and give God all you got. And there was not a lot of people that looked like me at this church, but I didn't care. I just started worshiping in my feet and my voice, I'm shouting and I'm lifting my hands and I'm giving God all I got. Didn't pay attention to the, the crowd around me, but as I saw the pastor take the stage, we all came to quiet. The pastor knew and the congregation knew that I was a foster kid in this church from a broken situation. And the pastor looked down and he looked right at me and he looked at the congregation and he said, you see that young man right there? We should all be worshiping the way that he is. Why are we not giving God all we got? I'm seven years old and in this moment, I didn't know that God was stamping me and saying that you're gonna be a worshiper for me. I didn't know I was a seven-year-old boy, but I knew one thing. When I worship, all the baggage that I had, I didn't remember it. All I knew is the moment, the presence, the aroma of the throne room. And I long for that. And I believe that's what worship does for us. It takes us to that moment, that first time that we felt or we heard or we seen God moving in our lives. What a sweetness about that. I pray that for your worship, that God reveals himself. 
the one here from the, the scripture that we just read from, from Deuteronomy, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The word is achad. Let me hear you say achad. Yes, if you got it right, the person in front of you got a little bit of your achad on them. And it, it doesn't, when we, when we hear one in a Western um, modern culture, we think two, three, four, five. That's not achad. Achad is one and only. <laughs> um, primary, set apart. Only in the category, <laughs> Achad. God is one, is the one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. This scripture from Deuteronomy chapter 6 was a reminder to the people of Israel of who they were and what was their first priority. The one journey reminds us of who we are and what it is that's our highest priority. One journey is a two-year church-wide discipleship experience to get crystal clear on the question of whose we are, who we are, what we're all about. One name the name of Jesus, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and tongue confess. Everything that we do is for and about Jesus. One life, Jesus changes us one life at a time. And our mission is to lead people to life-changing faith in Him. Whenever we see life change, we celebrate it. We're one church many locations, many expressions of the kingdom of God, but we are one church. And our vision is for one more, that we would do everything possible as a church to encourage and equip our members to reach one more person with the gospel. Luke chapter 15 says that Whenever there is one life that is changed, there is a celebration in heaven. We want to make that celebration happen over and over and over again. So I grew up in a church that's very restrictive, very rules driven. Follow the rules, follow the rules, stay in the lines. And once I left, I went to college. Pretty much any substance that you would give me, I tried. I wanted to go as far away from what I learned as I could. Jesus came to me by way of my wife. And one day I woke up, it was, a, it was a Sunday morning. So I get up and go downstairs and I see her watching, she's watching TV. She, goes, she said, uh, hey, come check this band out. I'm like, all right, whatever. So sit down and it's, Crossroads worship team, I said, I sat down, I said, oh, they're pretty good. So I just sort of sat and stayed for the message. About a year, year online, we're sitting there on the couch. I can remember the conversation. I'm like, do you think you want to try to go in person? We get to the door and we go in and we stand right at the entrance. Aaron Walton comes over and he's like, come on in. He's like, I'm Aaron. And he was so welcoming. Went in, sat down, and the worship team's up there, and I'm like, hey, that's that band. They're just as good in person. Sermon was great. We actually did starting point. Part of that is everyone gets to share their story, how you got to this moment. When it was my turn, I talked about all these things I did in college and just flat out turned in my back and just said, no, I don't want anything to do with this. And then I realized, oh my gosh, you've always been here. This whole time, when I turned my back, when I ran, I said, I don't want anything to do with you. You still cared enough to set guardrails, set, set some boundaries for me. That's when it really clicked for me. Not long after we started coming in person, they had auditions. So I auditioned and been on the team since then. Love serving, really being involved in the church, really 
sort of made me think about going public with my faith. And it was February 5th, 2023. Never forget that date. Since I found Jesus, I'm a happier person. Much more patient. I think I uh, probably should ask my wife how I've changed more so than me. I think just understanding Jesus being a model for what a man is supposed to be. There's one name. There's one name in heaven from which people have hope and are saved. The name of Jesus. There's one life. That's how the gospel works. One life at a time. Always has, always will. One church. Now, I'm not just talking about that we have multiple campuses and that we're one church. That's true. And I hope we um, feel that more than ever during this journey. But I mean, like the church. <laughs> like there's only one, the church. <laughs> Big C church. And we get to be a part of it. And we get to celebrate when the church wins. And then the last one is one more. And, and that's this heart behind. There's somebody who does not yet know that their creator loves them, has died for them, and has a purpose for their life. There's one more that doesn't know that yet. And as long as there's one more, we should keep looking. We should keep uh, our, our arms open to embrace one more. One name. church one more well welcome uh, again everyone and what an amazing journey this has been i want to say Welcome to everyone watching today in Eldersburg, at our Eldersburg campus, and at Hampstead. Uh, if you're watching online, uh, just wherever and whenever uh, you're uh, watching the service, you are a part of this journey. Uh, whether you jumped on today, if today is your first Sunday, we know every Sunday is somebody's first Sunday, or you've been here for the entire two years, this morning uh, is part of the conclusion of this one journey. And it feels somewhat significant if you invest that much time in something. Uh, you look back on it and wonder uh, what, what the uh, impact was of, of all that time spent. But, but I, I wanted to give you a, just a visual of what our hope was when we started the, the one journey. Um, you, you know that we, we said it, we wanted to remind ourselves of who we were and what was most important. But in addition to that, we wanted to um, do something very specific in terms of owning the vision of Crossroads Church. And I'm going to draw on the whiteboard here to, to give you a little perspective of it. We, we said two years ago, as we turned 20 as a church, that we went back to and talked about the heart of Crossroads, that these few couples uh, started with a, a heart that was to um, have a church that unchurched people would feel welcomed at and, and invited into and could find God there, and that, that there was a, a need for a church like that. And from that heart, over the next 20 years, what happened was way more than we could have ever imagined. And so what happened out of this heart was all sorts of expansion and growth and fruit, and it just kept going and going and going, and, and it just was way, way, way more than we ever thought when we began the process. And, and so wherever you came along as a part of what God was doing in our midst, the one journey was our attempt to say, okay, hold on, let's before we continue uh, and, and look at what God has next for us, let's do this. Let's try to make sure 
that wherever you came in, you were part of owning the vision. We want to expand the owners of the vision of the heart behind Crossroads. And we wanted your heart to be a part of that. And so um, over the last two years, we have been going back to the book of, of Colossians. And, and we've said, look, here's our vision. Our, our vision is that there's one life uh, that matters to God, and that's your life. That's the next life. And there's one name, the name of Jesus. And we are one church, and we're one church for one more. And so as we get ready to um, kind of move on into what's next, I know it'll be about one more. I know that it will be, I just don't know what the one more will look like. I, I, I started imagining the other day, uh, if we look back 20 years from now and think about, well, what one more was just around the corner in 2024? I wonder if it'll be one more foster kid, like you heard Robert talk about in his video. Maybe you know this. We, we have a foster and adoption uh, group that is uh, planning a social here as, as so many families are affected by that. I wonder if that'll be the one more. I wonder if it'll be one more person dealing with addiction, like you heard Mike's testimony. I wonder if it'll be one more marriage that was falling apart, that gets put back together by God in a miraculous way, and he uses us to do that. I wonder if it'll be one more person navigating a a health crisis, whether for them or for someone they love that gets surrounded by the community of grace uh, at, at Crossroads Church. I wonder if that'll be the one more. I, I wonder if it'll be one more family with a, a child with special needs that finds a place that embraces and provides opportunity uh, for their family. Well, I, I don't know what it might look like, but, but I do know this. That will, there will be one more generation as we hand off the baton, people my age, to the next generations. Um, we're making an investment as we um, get ready to purchase our Westminster building here. We are saying in this investment, one more generation is going to be able to hear the gospel. And this will be the launching pad for how we do that. I'm excited about one more. Um, I, I'm glad that I'm one more, for one more, and I'm glad that you are too. Let, let's go back one last time to the book of Colossians, which is all about the supremacy of Christ. What does it look like to put Jesus before all things? And we'll read these familiar verses now again, verses 2 to 6. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful, and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I might proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. God's word. And we've covered over the last two weeks this idea that if you want to put Jesus before all things, it starts and ends with prayer, uh, that we should be devoted to prayer, uh, being watchful and thankful in prayer, and that we can't do anything more than pray until we have prayed, until that becomes a part of who we are. And, and we said last week that the Apostle Paul models what prayer should look like if you're putting Jesus first. And sometimes my prayer looks like I'm putting me first. <laughs> and he models this. He's in prison and he prays for an open door, but it's not the one you think. It's an open door so that he could share the gospel one more time. 
And it says, if you're going to put Jesus first, you have to care about what Jesus cares about. And Jesus cares about people, especially people who are far from him, who are far from God. And so he, he prays for an open door. And, and the open door is an opportunity to experience God. And then I want to call your attention to the, this very specific way that the Apostle Paul says, and when I proclaim the gospel, when, when I get my shot, when I get my open door, pray that I proclaim the gospel clearly as I should. And, and then he gives a couple of bullet points that define what clear is when it comes to sharing the gospel. And, and the first thing he says is this, be wise. And he says, be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders. Interesting term here, but, but you and I know what it feels like to be an outsider, to feel like you don't fit in. Well, here's in the scripture, um, our um, leading to say, you have to understand that in your life, there are people who feel like they are outsiders when it comes to faith. For whatever reason and whatever angle they uh, received that message, they feel like outsiders. I bet you can think of a few right off the top of your head. And the Apostle Paul says, those are the people that Jesus cares about. And if you want to present the gospel to them clearly, the first thing you have to do is you have to be wise in the way that you act towards them. That, that sharing the gospel but only when necessary, use words, St. Aquinas said. And uh, the, the, the idea of showing before I tell is so important if I want to make the gospel message clear. And then he says this, in your conversation, that's important right there, the idea that in presenting the gospel to someone, um, it is not a presentation it's a conversation. You know what? What does conversation imply? It implies a, a two-way street. He says in the next verse, so that you may be able to answer questions. Well, you know what you have to do to uh, before you can answer a question? You have to hear the question. You have to stop talking long enough to hear the question. You have to not answer questions that no one's asking. Let your conversation and then I, I love this, be full, always full of grace. Now, I, I can't stress how um, important this is when you say, I, I really hope that this person who feels like an outsider, who, who feels like they're far from God, I, I'd love it if God would use me um, to bring them to himself well, here's what you got to do. Have your conversation with them always full of grace. It doesn't mean that uh, we leave the truth out. It says Jesus came full of grace and truth. But, but your conversation and mine uh, will be far more effective if they are filled with grace when it comes to our presentation of the gospel. And then this last line, uh, and seasoned with salt. Now, I don't know if you're a, a salt fan. Um, salt is one of those things that you only um, typically notice when it's missing. Um, and it, if something's bland or, you know, or that kind of thing. In the, in the first century, uh, salt was not so much a, um, a spice as it was a preservative. And so when Jesus famously says, um, you are the salt of the earth, he's not saying you spice it up. He's saying you can preserve it. You, you can be the thing that keeps it from disintegrating. And, and so the Apostle Paul picks up on that here, and, and he says, and seasoned with salt, um, that with this preservative uh, holding of life together, presenting people that it, I know that it feels like life has um, dealt you a bad hand, uh, but but let me let me preserve 
part of the purpose and hope that you can find in life. Have your conversation always filled with grace, seasoned with salt. Now, um, I was planning on um, stopping the the message right here at the the end of verse 6. But over the last week in reading through this last part, that on the surface sort of looks like um, just a bunch of names. There's 10 names, 11 if you include somebody who says, and he's his cousin. Uh, but, but there's 10 actual people that the Apostle Paul highlights in these last 10 verses. So in verses 7 through 17, I want to go through really briefly because he doesn't say much about them. I want to go through these names, and I want you to get the sense of why they matter. Because they're people. They're they're actual people. And the Apostle Paul is including them in this vision that he has. And so I want you to imagine this is us. We are these ten names. And the church... The big C church rises and falls as each individual understands their part of it. So uh, let's look at these together. I I made a couple of notes because I hadn't heard of most of these people before, but I think it's super interesting as we go through and see what the Apostle Paul says. He starts with this guy, Tychicus, Tychicus. I'm not sure how he would pronounce it. And he says, Um, He'll tell you all the news about me. Tychicus, we find out in the book of Acts, was from Asia. So he didn't look like Paul. He wasn't from the same uh, culture as Paul who was a a Jew. And then it says that he is sent, go to the next verse, he's sent for the express purpose that you may know about the circumstances that Paul has and that he may encourage your hearts. I love this, that the first person on the list, when he's talking about building the church, is this guy, Tychicus, and he is sent specifically not because he's a great speaker, not because he's a great musician, not because he's um, a a great uh, debater, not because he has a lot of money, but because he's an encourager. For some of you, this is your role. When I drew the big heart, Uh, around the vision. This is your role. You're an encourager, like Tychicus. All right, we got to keep going. Uh, The next name says, he's coming with this guy, Onesimus. And Onesimus is actually pretty famous in the New Testament because he has one of the, the books of the New Testament written sort of all about him. The book of Philemon is about Onesimus, who was a bondservant who ran away. Who, who owed somebody um, a debt and agreed to work for them for a certain amount of time and then took off and left to follow the Apostle Paul. And so I love this, this guy, and he's called a faithful and dear brother. And, and so this is, for some of you, you think that your past actions will prevent you from being an owner of the vision uh, right now at Crossroads and nothing, just look at Onesimus. Um, he would have had a terrible reputation prior to becoming part of what God was doing in the church. Next guy. This guy is um, Aristarchus. My fellow prisoner, Aristarchus. Now, he shows up in a couple of other places in the book of Acts when the Apostle Paul is shipwrecked. Aristarchus is there. When he's imprisoned in the Philippian jail, Aristarchus is there. It sort of reminds me of the, you know, the great philosopher and theologian Groucho Marx. He said, if you end up in jail, you, a good friend will always bail you out and a best friend will be sitting beside you. <laughs> this is this guy. Aristarchus is, is there. He's the guy sitting in jail with Paul. He's so faithful. He's so loyal. Then, then he, we talk about the, this guy, Mark. He might be one of the, the two most famous people 
in the, the passage because he wrote the gospel of Mark. But guess what happened before he did that? He and Paul, who's writing this letter, they had a falling out. You can read about it in the book of Acts. As Paul was getting ready to go on his second missionary journey, he and Mark have a disagreement, and he says, I'm not bringing you with me. You stay home. I'm going out. And here's the great thing. Now they're back together. We don't know exactly how that happened, but, but here's the great news. Some of you feel like, oh, gosh, I got sideways with somebody five years ago, and I guess I can't serve anymore. No. Um, he, he went on to write a gospel, <laughs> and he's a part of the list of what God is doing in the church. The next one is a, is a really easy name for us, Jesus, but not that one. <laughs> this, and he says, Jesus, who is also called Justice, which I imagine was important because when they would introduce themselves as Jesus, people would go, <gasps> and they would go, no, 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 not that one. And so they would just introduce him as, as Justice. And the great thing about um, Jesus called Justice is, you know what else we know about him? Nothing. <laughs> Literally nothing. And, and I just, some of you who are listening to this right now feel like, that the church, the vision of our community is somebody else's, that you're a nobody. And uh, what I want you to see is Jesus called justice. Not another word written about him, but he's on the team. He's a, a, a important enough that the apostle Paul names him. A couple of more. Epaphras, um, who is one of you, that, that means... Um, Epaphras is someone who actually planted the church in Colossae. And he is now praying for them, wrestling in prayer for them. He's not there anymore. Don't you know that there are uh, some people who are affecting your faith, our church, who aren't even here anymore, um, but they're praying for us. Epaphras is the person who planted the church and who is now praying for for the continuation of the church. Next name, Luke. And Luke is that Luke, the writer of the Gospel of Luke and also the writer of the book of Acts. And he's a physician, a doctor. And he did all that while still being a doctor. He never stopped being a doctor. For, for some of you, the way that you are owning the vision of Crossroads Church is at your business. Is, is that your place of employment? Um, whether you are an employer or an employee, that's your mission field, just like Luke. And then Demas, and Demas is, is with Luke. And here's what you need to know about Demas. If you fast forward to 2 Timothy chapter 4, the Apostle Paul writes this. Demas, he loved the world and has deserted me and went to Thessalonica. You know what happens in Thessalonica? I don't know, I don't know either, but apparently it wasn't great, but according to the Apostle Paul. And, and here's the, that's, that happens. When you're doing the work of the church, people come and people go. And it doesn't, um, it doesn't dissuade or change the vision that God has for the community. There's two more. Um, Nympha, which I think is an um, unfortunate name uh, for a woman in the church, but it, it just meant bride um, back then. And, and I love this, that the church in Colossae meets in her house. So somehow, sort of like Lydia, who is mentioned also in Acts, there are these women um, who have created enough or inherited enough um, resources to host the whole thing. And it wouldn't happen without them. And so Nympha has the church in her house. Some of you have resources and you shouldn't in any way be apologetic for the resources that God has given you. That's your role. And you're hosting and you're resourcing and, and that's how you're part of the vision. And then one more, this last guy. Archippus, and I, you could just write your name in here. 
Because here's what it says about Archippus. See to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. Steve, see to it that you complete the ministry that you have received in the Lord. Jenny, see to it that you complete the ministry that you have re- Just put your name in there. And, and what we see is that vision that we wanted to clarify of who we are and what's important, it's you. It, there is no we without you. And so as a church, not just a little small group of people, a large group of people now, we want to embrace this idea that we want to live out the ministry that God has given to us, whether you're in a Luke or an Epaphras or a Nympha or an Archicus, we all are part owners of this vision together. And we'd be remiss if we didn't read this one last verse. Colossians 4.18. Last book, last verse of the whole book. We're done. I, Paul, Write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. And so as we end uh, this sermon series anyway on uh, the one journey, the one way, and, and, and we invite everybody to be a part of what God is doing next, the, our team thought, well, maybe we should end the same way Paul did, that uh, that I should write a letter, uh, a letter to our church family um, in the broadest sense that you can imagine those words. And so I want to end uh, by reading you this, this really brief letter. Uh, we'll have copies of it if you like it and want to um, read it again. But uh, before now, uh, let me read. Dear Crossroads Church, when God called me and my family 20 years ago to move back to my hometown to pastor a church of 25 or 30 people meeting in a garage, I had no idea what was about to happen. That was part of the allure, actually. Trusting God for what was not in my control And now 20 years later, so much has happened and so much has not changed. (laughs) Sure, we have several thousand people who call Crossroads home these days and every Sunday is someone's first Sunday. All of this is more than we could have asked or imagined. But we are still challenged daily to trust God and we're still not in control. Whenever and however you join the Crossroads journey, I am genuinely so grateful that we get to experience this together. I may get to stand up on a stage most Sundays and deliver a message that I believe God has for us, which is truly one of the greatest joys of my life. But without all of you, we would not be who we are. We would not be able to lead people to life-changing faith in Jesus Christ the way we have. We really do get to do this together. So as we embark on the next part of the journey, I can guarantee you we have no idea what is about to happen. I know we will need to keep the main thing, Jesus, the main thing. I know we will have to continually look for opportunities to serve our communities and consistently demonstrate the love of Christ before we talk about it. I know we will have to decide that people who are not yet here are just as important to God as the people who are already here. And I know that when we do trust God and take steps of faith through open doors, he still does immeasurably more than we can ask or even imagine. If that piques your interest, then let's go all in for whatever and wherever God leads us next. 
Grace and peace, Crossroads. Grace and peace.